Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. It's great to have you with us. And you know, uh, we've done this a lot of programs here on the rise of the right, and we'll continue to do that. But something happened on the way to the forum, and uh, the editor-in-chief here is a guy named Max Alvarez, who's been doing, you've heard his work as well and seen it, been doing some great work, and he's turned the tables. So I think he's actually come into the studio today to take over my show. I have no <laughs> idea what the hell he's going to do, but something's happening here. Max? <laughs> Well, thank you, Mark. Um, <laughs> yes, and uh, uh, apologies to uh, all of uh, Mark's incredible listeners. Um, I am Maximilian Alvarez. I am the editor in chief here at The Real News, and uh, I am at least just for a day, sort of like a pirate uh, boarding the ship. I wanted to kind of uh, commandeer the Mark Steiner show uh, for for an afternoon um, because. You know, Mark, it, it's, I mean, it's an incredible honor and joy to get to work with you. I mean, working with you is one of the reasons that I left my old job to come work at The Real News. I mean, like, people like you, Eddie Conway, Eddie. Justin Knorr, Lisa McRae, like, all the amazing folks who were here, like, that's why I left in the middle of a pandemic a good job at the Chronicle of Higher Education to, to be the editor-in-chief here at The Real News Network. And, you know, the, the, the work that you do, uh, the work that you've done over the course of your career is just, you know, legendary. And I've learned so much from it. And I've been really, yeah, excited um, to see the development of these two kind of key ongoing series that, that you are uh, producing here on the Mark Steiner Show, namely um, the Not In Our Name series, which... Yeah looks at a plethora of voices across the political spectrum, primarily uh, voices across, um, you know, the Jewish diaspora, Jews in Israel, um, Europe, beyond, all speaking out against the occupation. And that's an incredible series in its own right. And it's not unconnected to the other series that you've been doing on the rise of the right, um, which you, of course, kind of started as a limited intense collaboration uh, with our comrade and now Real News board member, Bill Fletcher Jr. And if folks uh, listening to this haven't already, you should definitely go back into the Steiner Show catalog or the Real News Network podcast feed and find those original episodes from the beginning of the Rise of the Right series that was co-hosted by Mark and Bill, because uh, I think it's really well done. Uh, really brilliant uh, number of episodes. The conversations were great. And I think it, it really gives us an important base to start with uh, if we're going to kind of like start anywhere and learning about like what we're up against right now when it comes to the right and especially the far right, sure. uh, where it comes from, how it works, <clears throat> how it draws people in, what its ideology is what its goals are, how it achieves those goals through violence in different forms, so on and so forth. And so obviously, in the course of doing that series uh, with Bill Fletcher, you uh, realize that there's a whole lot more to talk about here. And so that's why I've been really excited to see us extend the Rise of the Right series on the Mark Steiner show um, to kind of keep these conversations going. And um, you know, you, you just published a new installment of this series, which was an extended interview with the author Jeff Charlotte about his new incredible book, The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War. Yeah. And as soon as I knew that that book was coming out, I had earmarked. I was like, I want to get him on <laughs> Mark's show because I got to get these guys in conversation. And I wasn't wrong. That conversation was incredible. The Both of you just brought so much to the table and I learned so much um, from that conversation. But I wanted to kind of sit down with you to sort of record a spiritual sequel to that conversation because the questions you were asking Jeff Charlotte were, you know, intense, provocative, generative, and, and Jeff just had so many amazing and insightful things to say in response. But I could tell there was just so much experience in your background and and you know you were the questions were coming from a place of experience as a veteran organizer 
who cut his teeth, you know, decades and decades ago. And if, and if you have kept that struggle going throughout your life, you know, but you cut your teeth really, you know, in the era of the civil rights movement, the radical 60s, the 1970s, you know, organizing in communities, organizing within um, the labor movement and trying to bring, you know, right and left together, black and white together, Jews and Gentiles <laughs> together, right? I mean, like that, I've heard you say a number of times on your show Right. You know, like how important and fundamental, you know, that has always been to your organizing. And so I thought it would be, you know, good and important and necessary to kind of follow up on your interview with Jeff Charlotte and all the great Rise of the Right series uh, installments that you've done so far in this series and kind of turn the tables a bit and and, uh, get listeners to hear a little more about that experience in your background and what it, how it informs your thinking about, um, politics today, the right, uh, that we are confronting, uh, in the 21st century, the state of the world and how we organize our way towards a better future. So that's really why I kind of roped you into this kind of this conversation. I'm, I'm very grateful to you for being game for it. Um, and, and, and so I guess, you know, like, let's, let's, let's hop into it. I mean, like, maybe this will be the first of many conversations that we can have because you have just so much experience in this area. So I don't want us to feel like we have to cover it all in one conversation. But if this is the beginning of, you know, a single conversation or multiple conversations, I thought it would be important to sort of start with just asking you about your pathway into organizing. And like, what drew you to becoming someone who saw organizing and mobilizing people as just a a, a fundamental part of your existence? Because I think most of us were just like, I'm just going to worry about myself. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to do what I got to do at work to get my paycheck. I'm going to go home. You know, if there's a problem in my neighborhood, I don't know, maybe I'll talk to my neighbors, but like, there's a very different mindset that you have as an organizer, as someone who sees problems in the world as fixable and as problems that can be fixed if you bring people and communities together. Like that's a different way of understanding your place in the world than I think a lot of us have. So I wanted to ask like where that commitment to organizing came from for a young Mark Steiner. Yeah, it's my mother's fault. <laughs> <laughs> It was in some ways. My mom was a Brit, drove an ambulance in World War II, pulling people out of the rubble. And she crossed the color line early in segregated Baltimore and in segregated Britain in many ways. And so it really started when (laughs) I was um, 13 and we were in Mandaman Shopping Center, which is a shopping center on the west side of Baltimore. That was a mostly Jewish shopping center. Yeah, it's like two blocks from where I live now. Right, not right. <laughs> and so we were there and looking over the railing and down below at the White Coffee Pot, which was a chain of restaurants, there was a group of black students, turned out to be black students from Morgan State University, uh, picketing, and a couple of white people, picketing the White Coffee Pot. So I asked my mother, could I join the picket line? And she said, well, all right, love, we're going to ask the picket captain, see what he says. So, <laughs> and we went downstairs and we introduced ourselves, my mother did, and yeah, he said, here, gave me a sign. I started picketing. And um, from that day, I was part of the civic interest group, which was like Baltimore, Baltimore's arm of SNCC. And they wouldn't let me sit in until I was 16, because um, I was too young to get arrested, they thought, at 13, 14 years old. So they made me wait till I was 16. And I did get arrested a bunch of times. So that's really where it began. I mean, it was, it was, uh, and, 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 and being at the f- foot of the brilliant Gloria Richardson, who was the lead person organizing in Cambridge, Maryland. One of my greatest thrills is when I went to interview her years later before she passed away. We have it on tape. And she, and I went to, and I told her I was in Cambridge. She said, Oh, she said, Oh, I remember you. You were that little white boy. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, so 
So I mean, that's where it started was for me in the civil rights movement was there. And, um, but, get, but what as a little white boy made you want to join that picket line? A lot of things. One was, um, Emmett Till and the pictures in life and look magazine, the, just his disfigurement and, 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 and knowing that my parents, my mother especially was very clear about there's no difference between us, but we lived in a segregated world that when I was 11 years old in that Boy Scout troop, well, he, actually that's where Billy began, was because when I was 11, I became a Boy Scout. This might sound strange, but what happened was I was sitting at the, it, it, my mother, so there was a woman, like most white families, there's a black woman who worked in the home, domestic worker. Her name was Miss, Mrs. Moselle Jackson. And she had a nephew whose name is Mr. Dennis Foster who would pick her up, take her home. And my mother and, and the two, those two would have coffee and cake at the end of the day together all the time. And I, and I ran downstairs and say, Mom, I'm going to be 11 years old next week. I got to join the Boy Scouts. And so she said, she said, all right, love, went straight away. We'll sign you up for Beth the Fellow, which was the local synagogue troop. And I said in my naivete, because I've been reading about Boy Scouts and Brotherhood Jamborees and in my naivete, I said, I, I don't want to be in a troop with all Jewish kids. I want to be with lots of different people, which didn't exist. And, and so at the table, Mr. Foster said, I'm a scout master, you can join my troop. And my mother cocked her head and smiled and went, oh, that's a lovely idea. She knew exactly what that meant. Mm. So he picked me up that Monday and we drove from Northwest Baltimore down to Walbrook Junction through North Avenue, which is on the west side of town, all the way to the east side of town on North Avenue to Ashland Avenue off of Broadway, which was a black working class neighborhood near Johns Hopkins Hospital and um, pulled up in front of the Faith Baptist Church, got out of the car, and I, <laughs> that's how my line has always been. I walked into the basement of the church, and it was an integrated troop, because I integrated the troop. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so I became part of that world, and, and it, several things began to happen, which led to the picket line. One was, one day we were, a bunch of guys in the car, and he stopped to get donuts, everybody and all the boys piled out of the car and i sat in the back and didn't move and i'll never forget his words to me he looked back in the back of the seat and said mark wherever we can go you can go and i knew that wasn't the case the other way around edwin johnson who became my best friend in the troop and we remained friends until he passed away he had been a black panther he later became a city councilman and and we were really tight he was an auto worker and we became best buddies. And I stayed at his house, he stayed at my house. We, we camped together and shared food together and um, several things happened. One was when I stayed at his house, in this row house, in a room with, with three or four brothers who were sleeping together, the heating grate, blaring the heat up through the house. I'd never experienced something like that before. And when he came to my house, we slept in separate beds in my bedroom. and. When I was at his house, the boys in the neighborhood accepted me. We were hung out and we played and did all kinds of stuff on the streets of East Baltimore. Came to my place and the kids wouldn't play with us. And we couldn't go to the white coffee pot. We couldn't go to the movie theater. You know, we tried. It wouldn't let us in. And so I, early on as a little boy, I began to realize this is pretty fucked up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and I'd read about the civil rights movement and it was 1916, I read about all that stuff in the Freedom Riders and things, and, and so I saw that picket line, and I said, I wanna be there. And that started it. And then it just, you know, I mean, I've gone through a lot of political changes over the years, beliefs have changed, you know, I was, <laughs> I joined the Young Socialist Alliance, which was a Trotsky group back in, when I was 15, and uh, later I joined the Stalinist group, the Communist Labor Party, and I, I, didn't, I, I left them too, but I mean, <laughs> We, but so I've had my sojourns. Murray Bookchin became a teacher of mine, who was a great anarchist thinker. So it's you know it's like I, I wandered my way through the left a lot of different different iterations. But but I but that started me off, and I as an organizer, it just came to me. I mean, I I was in high school before I was expelled from high school. These a bunch of black and white guys I was friends with because. <laughs> I was a fuck up, and so I, I, I ended up in B21 in the 10th grade, which was the lowest class you could be in academically, and there was this quarter of, quarter of 
young guys in that class who were all pretty bright, but we all ended up in B21. <laughs> and we started, I said, we st I said, let's start a frat, our own frat. And we called ourselves Beta Omega Beta, B-O-B, -B, Bigotry or Brotherhood. And so we began the first kind of interracial frat in Baltimore among high school kids, you know? And so it just, I mean, it was just organizing almost, it became like part of my DNA. It became, it just became, was a young boy, you know? And, and that's where it began. And then um, it kept on rolling, you know? Well, and like, I mean, you've mentioned things to this effect. Um, so, you know, this is, this is probably a, a leading question, but, but, but also a genuine one because I, I found as a person of color, mixed race, first generation Mexican American, but my mom's white passing, um, you know, I found, um, talking to a lot of other white folks and of course the generational di difference, you know, like does mean that like the circumstances are quite different. Yeah. But I have found that white people, white friends, folks that I've organized with, uh, folks that I would call comrades, um, I feel like the ones who got it when it came to like understanding how race impacted the lives of non-white people were were the white friends who had some other mark against them mm. like they were poor or working class or they were immigrants from Romania right i had a i had a friend stefan isachescu right you know his his parents basically f fled ceausescu right and like but like they they had a different sense of their whiteness in orange county california than than my native born white friends if that makes sense yeah so I bring all this up to say, um, you know, and, and it's come up in, in a lot of other registers, right? I was just interviewing an incredible woman. She's a, a labor union organizer in Slovenia, but um, she talked about how, you know, the fact that um, her mother was Croatian meant that like they were sort of second class citizens growing mm. up in the 90s. And so she, she identified more with like the Mexican experience. And she told me as such, she's like, so I, mm. like, I, she's like, I would, I would compare my experience to like the Mexican American experience in the United States. And it made sense to me. I feel like you've mentioned that, you know, you had, you had cousins who survived the Holocaust yeah. who would sit in your living room. Like did the, did the Jewish side of you, did that history, like did that play a role in feeling more identified with other downtrodden populations or, or identifying less with the sort of non-Jewish white America? That's interesting. I mean, it, it, because when I was growing up and when my father grew up, we were separate and we lived in a separate neighborhoods. We didn't live, I mean, there were two Christian homes on my block and they were both older people who lived there before the Jews moved in. And, um, yeah, there were, I mean, the, the only Christians, non-Jews in the neighborhood were the, were the, were the, were the shikshas that the men married. Shikshas mm -hmm. being a Yiddish term for non-Jewish woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I only know but, that because I watched Seinfeld growing up. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the male part of the counterpart of that is shagets. So there were some shagets and some shikshas there, as we used to say. But, yes, I mean, look, in our living room, as example, my cousin Pesach, who... I had, I remember because he was like this short, thick guy, um, like you, thick. I mean, he was strong looking <laughs> physically, you know. Um, and he had this number right there on his right arm. And my cousin Ruchel, who had come, went to Israel, snuck, and snuck into, into Palestine, she had a number on her arm. And I, and I knew what they meant because I saw the pictures. I remember the pictures of people in concentration camps. And so that had a profound effect on me. I mean, there's a reason why the vast majority of white, Caucasian, however uh, you want to say it, freedom riders were Jews because we grew up, that generation, 
in the Holocaust experience with our families. I think that's a huge piece of it. And then the struggle around Israel, back when we were kids, we identified that as a struggle of liberation. We weren't aware of what it was doing to Palestinians. We just were aware that it, it was our liberation struggle after people tried to wipe us out. And so all that, you know, drove a lot of white Jewish people to be part of the civil rights movement. I mean, that's why, I mean, you know, Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney, Schwerner and Goodman were Jews. And so it had a profound effect on me and many other people in my, gen in my broad generation, people born from like 1940 to 1950 who were involved in stuff because of that. And I knew people didn't like us because we were Jews. I also knew that I had cousins, some cousins, I won't mention their names now because I don't want to hurt their children, but um, I had cousins who would use the term Schwarze Hilaria, the black disease. And they were the business owners. And I realized the black guys I hung on the corner with, I, I became, a, that's another long story we have to get into, but I became like a corner boy. I was the white boy on the corner, dressing like a jitterbug. And I remember the anti-Semitism among a lot of the young black guys I ran with in the street who hated Jews because, in part, because Christians didn't like Jews, but also in part because there were too many Jewish store owners and landlords who were pieces of shit. And not all of them, but enough that people began to identify them as the Jews that we hate. So that just fueled my anti -Semitism, people's anti-Semitism even more. And it really got to me. I mean, it, was, it really tore me up. And I, you know, it, and I got into more than one fight around that, a physical fight. Usually I'd ignored it, but sometimes I couldn't. But all that complexity, you know, I think that's what probably drove me to join the Young Socialist Alliance because they were communists and there were a lot of Jews in it. Um, the man who started it in Baltimore, Bob Kaufman, was a real noted figure in this town for years as, as, a, as a lone radical out there. And Trotsky was a Jew. I mean, so there was, it was very complex, mm -hmm. you know. Jews were also the found, at the founding of the NAACP. All of that was in there in my head. Mm -hmm. That is the concentration camp stuff. And so for me, it was just a natural, I was always an outsider. And so to be in the civil rights movement pushed me even further outside of most of the white world, but it was where I needed to be, you know. And I learned so much from the older heads in the group, black folks and Jews who were part of the civil rights movement. I just learned so much. And I, it just became part of my life. I was chairman of the National Conference of Christians and Jews Brotherhood Youth Group, co-chairman with a black guy whose name was uh, Elbert Bishop. And uh, we put together this summer camp and we would, you know, like, we had to assign cabins and we had these jokes between us about, uh, I'll trade you two Jews for three, for three <laughs> Asians and, and to, to make yeah. sure the cabins were mixed. And, and, and but it makes me, all of that, I just was part of my world. And, and from a little boy on, 11 on, my world was just so deeply racially mixed. I mean. Well, and like, you know, it, it makes me think of something that um, our departed brother, a longtime friend and comrade of yours, Eddie Conway, Eddie. Uh, said in, in an interview once. Um, I think it was with Bob Shear when Bob was sort of asking him the blunt question of how did you do it? How did you survive mm. 44 years wrongfully imprisoned? Um, which is, I think, the question that all of us wanted to ask Eddie at one point or another. And, you know, Eddie said something about developing his consciousness and holding on to that and, and, and holding it sacred to constantly be learning and lifting that consciousness and, and bringing your ability to see the world for what it is. Um, and he mentioned that because once you raise your consciousness, they can never take that away from you. That's right. And he said, they can break your spirit, but they can never take away your consciousness of your circumstances. And I mentioned that because I feel like for what I'm hearing from you and connecting it to the conversations that you have on this show week in and week out is that you've spent your entire life in radio as a community organizer, even a labor organizer, 
right? Tenant organizer, right? But just like, I feel like what we're describing here as like a fundamental part of who you are is trying to bring that consciousness, you know, to, to other people because you have seen and experienced from a young age how much better things can be if we stop fighting with each other over our racial differences, our, our religious differences. Uh, if we actually work together, we can get so much farther in making the world a better place. To, I mean, not to sound hacky and cliche, but yeah. it really is that. Like, you know, if, because I feel like that is the through line through so much of the conversations that you have is that I've seen it. I, I Mark Steiner, have seen and witnessed how much better things can be when white and black, even people in the Panthers and the Klan come together and, and are fused together through struggle to recognize who our real common enemies are and how to defeat them and do so in a way that improves life for all of us. And so it's like, I feel like that, ex that experience, what you've witnessed, that consciousness has never left you. And so it's the kind of standard that you apply to everything that you see of like, how do we bridge these divides? How do we confront this as you always say? And how do we, how do we uh, do our best to sort of apply those lessons that you've learned through hard scrabble experience uh, to the kind of political uh, struggles that we're facing today? Like, I guess, is that off, Base or do, does that sound? No, I mean, look, I, I think that race and racism are some of the deepest issues that we have to, deepest points in American society we have to confront and address. It destroys class unity, it destroys lots of things, but most of all, it destroys people of color. And it's a really tough one. I mean, it's, it's hard to get beyond on a lot of levels. There's so much distrust. On one hand, there's so much distrust in let's say the black world towards the white world, it's also an openness that people completely miss all the time. You know, you can overcome racism through group therapy sessions and shit like that. And yeah, it can work. But it's not the same as watching it and become part of it, being overcome through common struggle. It begins to change perceptions. Light bulbs go off in people's head. Before I came here today, I was talking to my buddy, High Thurman. High Thurman is one of the Young, younger guys in the Young Patriot movement in Chicago. Young Patriots were white guys from Appalachia and in Alabama and Mississippi who moved to Chicago. And they created, they were a gang. And out of that gang, like the Young Lords and the rest, they, they, they created a political organization, as did the Young Lords, as did um, the, the, a number of other groups in, in Chicago. And I was talking to High about that. And, 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 you know, he, look, some of the people who ran the Young Patriots who I became really, really tight with in the late 60s because I met them at an SDS meeting and we hit it off because we hit it off because of our street thing. Because most white guys in, in SDS were upper middle class and came from a different, well, I did too, but it came from a world that didn't, wasn't there. And, and our street corner thing is what got us tight. And then I realized that some of the guys who began the Young Patriots had been in the Klan. I'm not talking on the periphery, I'm talking were in the Klan, like Doug Youngblood, who was the leader of the Young Patriots, a you know, bad motherfucker that he was, and who had done time in, in the joint for manslaughter. But he and I just connected, and I, and I went to Chicago to spend time with him, and you saw these former Klansmen in meetings with the Black Panthers. And I'll never forget this meeting, which actually is in one of the documentaries, I forget which one, it's still there. When the leaders of the Panthers were there with this group of white folks from uptown Chicago and the embrace that took place, knowing that they had been in a Klan. And that was then, this is now. It's like when I was a, a civil rights worker in Mississippi, I wasn't a civil rights worker in Mississippi, I was a civil rights worker in Cambridge, Maryland and Baltimore. But we had gone down to Mississippi a bunch of times for different various reasons. Not necessarily to demonstrate, but for meetings and whatever else. And there was the two times that I got to be in close proximity to Fannie Lou Hamer. She's one of the most important Americans that ever lived in my book. And 
woman beaten and tortured by the police and never stopped. But I happened to be there one day where there was so, some, I even forget what the gathering was, what was happening, and these white people were there, came in. This is around 1965, maybe, six? Okay. Somewhere around there. I, I don't remember the exact year. I, mean, I can go back and grab my notes. No, no, home. just to give but people I mean, a sense I don't, I don't of the timeline. But, and we were there in a gathering, and I heard some people said to Fannie Lou, you, you can't let those people in here because they're in the Klan. And her response was something like, baby, look, once you've been with us for a while, they're not being in the Klan much longer. And those are the kind of things that you have to kind of really understand and put your hands around that building a cross racial coalition is the only way we're going to win. The only way we're going to change things. It's not easy work, but it can be done. And people do come over. Doug Youngblood always talked about that. You know, about if you're Southern and white and poor, you're, you're your natural populist instincts draw you to the Klan or other groups like that. But when you overcome that and that spirit goes a different way, it builds a power that is almost unstoppable when it begins. I saw it happen numerous times. I mean, I wasn't part of the woodworkers, the pulp, wor uh, uh, pulp woodworkers in Alabama, Mississippi, but I had witnessed it and I was there a few times and I got to know a bunch of folks really well. Man, when you asked me to do this, I sort of, going back to my old stuff, it's just all this stuff sort of coming back, that, mm -hmm. you know, from, from, that, from that time and those, and those folks. I mean, if, if you can imagine with the two instances, the two things, I mean, a, a, a Miss, on the Mississippi, Alabama border, black and white workers coming together, they did backbreaking work, they, who got cheated all the time by these people on these on the on the forest and and own the mills. I mean, we'd literally cheat them out of you know they would they would pay them by the stack, and and they would cheat them by saying, "Oh, that stack's not that big. It doesn't fit that doesn't fit in there. So you're only getting half the money." And these workers came together, and I started googling this stuff when I thought we were going to talk today, trying to find are oh, these guys who's still alive from then. I want to find them. And yeah, see, and see where they are now. Yeah, we got to do a follow up, you know, um, and and record with them. I mean, but this is this is why I wanted to do this because I know you've got so much of that uh, historical knowledge and experience. And frankly, I regret not getting to have these kinds of conversations with Eddie. Oh man, um, before he got sick. I mean, granted, it was my first year at the Real News. We we're scrambling to stay afloat. It was still during and COVID. Who, and who, uh, who knew that Brother Eddie was going to get sick? And who knew, right? Um, and so I, I, but I regret it still. And and I don't want to make that mistake with with you know ever again. I want to keep learning as much as I can from folks who've been in the movement for a lot longer than I have, like you, like Bill Fletcher, like so many of the folks that you guys talk I love to Bill on Fletcher. this. Oh yeah, it feels great. I mean, like, and and even when you can, you have like intense disagreements. Like, Bill's a guy you can disagree with and talk through yeah. and, and struggle over. And I and I think I would encourage my fellow young uh, or youngish. I'm not young anymore. I'm in a, a millennial. Um, but uh, I, you know, folks in my generation and Gen Z, like, we should really take advantage of these folks in the movement while we have the chance we should learn as much as we can um because there's so much that you guys fought in the past that we can learn from and and better know how to fight the folks that like we're fighting today the forces that we're fighting today and again that's that's why i wanted to have this conversation because i can i know that in every conversation you have about what we are up against today and how we confront it, which are like kind of the, the questions that always come up for you. Like I can tell that so much of the answer has to come from what we're already talking about here, from what you have seen and witnessed. Like when you're talking about that power of working people coming together through common struggle and building the solidarity out of that struggle, that that is a force powerful enough in your eyes 
to take on the even like the the most vicious and virulent forces of the far right today like one can counteract the other and you've seen it and so i want us to like conclude with with that question um but before we get there i wanted to sort of zero in on those the, those two examples that you mentioned um and 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 sort of get more of a sense of of your involvement with them because you know i've i've joked around with you many times that like to me you're like the forest gump of the left <laughs> right but what i mean is like you know the the whole plot of that movie i'm, I'm, I'm simple minded i understand no <laughs> <laughs> but it's like the whole plot of the movie right is that he shows up in significant yeah parts uh, or, or, or like sites of history right he's in vietnam he's at you know the, the nixon white house he he meets jfk or, or he meets lyndon johnson at one point like so that's kind of like the narrative spielberg <laughs> right, right. builds is that there's just this guy who shows up in these significant parts of history even if he's not like you know intensely involved in it and so i make the joke about you being the forrest gump of the left because i feel like every time i talk to you <laughs> about you know, labor struggles in the South, you're like, oh yeah, I used to organize with these guys or I was organizing with the steel workers and, uh, you know, or I was organizing with uh, tenants in Baltimore uh, or I was in the abortion underground. And I was like, man, you've been fucking everywhere. <laughs> like, well, <laughs> yeah. Part of it was, it was also a necessity. I mean, I'm going to dive into abortion underground now, but that was a necessity because my girlfriend got pregnant and I had to, she didn't want a baby. Yeah. That's how we got in it. Um, I'm stayed in it. But, you know, we have to do it again, it looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we're in Baltimore and, and one of the most significant coalitions that we helped create that might in some weird way have had, have helped gentrification, though that wasn't in our heads then. Mm was in South Baltimore. And we started a collective. There was already people from the University of Wisconsin came down and created these collectives in South Baltimore in the early 70s. And um, we had a small collective. Um, first, we called ourselves the Red Karma Tribe. <laughs> <laughs> then we, we, just, we just became the Warren Avenue Collective. <laughs> We figured that it wasn't a, a good organizing tool to be called the Red Karma Tribe. So we... <laughs> Probably wise. Right, right, yeah. right, right. But we liked it. But anyway, so... Um, but in South Baltimore, a community newspaper was put out called the South Baltimore Voice. And we were part of that. And we began organizing with a group called the Tenants Union Group, Tuck. And we organized across the divide on Charles Street. And the divide was that on our side of Charles Street was a working class white community, a mixture of dock workers and laborers and this was a working class white community. And on the other side of Charles Street was Sharp Leadenhall, which is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, free black communities in this country from the 19th century, still there, was there. And it was a scene when I was a kid, it's where a riot broke out when they tried to integrate Southern High School in 1954, I believe. And there were riots ensued not to not let black kids come in the school. So there's always these racial tensions in that in between both sides of Charles Street. But we organized both sides of Charles Street because we were, they were we, the, the, it was the same slumlords on either side of Charles Street, exploiting the white workers, exploiting the black workers. So we built an interracial tenants union that was highly successful. We actually literally changed the housing laws in Baltimore because as a coalition, in our rent strikes, we had organized rent strikes and it held on to the money, picketed the landlords, and so they couldn't, if we lost, we wouldn't be able to give the money out so that people wouldn't lose their homes. Um, we made a coalition with the legal aid, legal aid, and they helped. We helped rewrite the laws, and they fought. They fought our cases in court, in tenants' court. I became a 
um, a, a not a lawyer, but they allowed us. To, you didn't have to be a lawyer to, to argue in tenants court. So I did a lot of arguing in tenants court with the, with the tenants, um, and we had guerrilla actions like. They, when they evicted somebody, we would pick up their shit and we put them back in the house and change the locks. Every time they threw them out, we go back in the house and change the locks. <laughs> and we, <laughs> you know, um, so, and then we would take the rats and roaches that we found in people's homes and we put them in cages and we left them on the doorstep of the <laughs> landlord's homes. <laughs> Things like that. You know, we had those actions as well. But the significant part was that this was the first time, I think, that these workers came together other than if they were working on the docks or other places, came together there to fight together across racial lines. And it was different than the unions, only in that it became social, that people had dinners in each other's homes and meetings in each other's homes. It wasn't like, they were only blocks apart, but they were miles, you know, miles apart in, in terms of communication. But, and so, people began to change because they were struggling with black workers and black workers with white workers in a way that they'd never done before. And it made people start thinking about their own racism. They didn't, we, look, we didn't have sessions talking about, now we have to deal with your racism and, and, and let's talk about why you hate black people, all that kind of crap. No, because that's an intellectual exercise. This was a, 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 a workers coalition where people actually began to change because they saw the humanity and the other people and began working together. Um, and I remember the tensions when there were a couple of interracial relationships that began. And that, that was pretty tense for a while. I'm talking about romantic relationships. Yeah. But it, 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 changed, it, it changed the laws. It built a coalition that, that where people remained friends forever. And then what happened was that that's when the gentrifiers started moving in. Because the landlords started saying, okay, we're going to get out of this. We're going, to sell, we're going to sell these homes for lots of money to these people. And it began to change the entire nature of the neighborhood. But those experiences and what I experienced in Mississippi and Alabama, just viscerally watching what was going on in the organizing taking place, the stuff in Chicago and the Rainbow Coalition, the Poor People's Campaign with King in 68 that I was part of, that I worked with the Young Patriots in Chicago to organize poor whites in the South and, and, and across the country to be part of the Poor People's Campaign. You, that is the... It can be done, and unless we do that, we're never going to win. Mm. Well, let me let me ask you, kind of following up on that, um, because as I was saying before, it's like I can I can hear when you're doing your interviews that that you you go back to those examples, you go back to that time, you go back to those common struggles and the bonds that were forged among people through that common struggle and you point to that as like the this is the force that can counteract the right today that can counteract not just that but also like it can build a sense of solidarity it can build a sense of solidarity and community that can that is necessary for poor and working people to win gains right to improve their workplaces, get better wages, get more say over their working conditions, uh, push back against predatory landlords, even um, defending themselves and their neighbors against police mm. violence, right? Like, you know, like the, the, it, there's a real kind of, I think, elemental sense of the way forward is through collective people power and this is how you build it. Um, I wanted to ask though, um, like what that looked like at the time as an antidote to right-wing politics of the age, mm -hmm. right? So like, again, I guess to, to connect the dots, what I'm saying is that we're talking about this organizing in, from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s as a, an example of the antidote to kind of the reactionary right wing, the increasingly fascistic right wing politics that we're seeing today. So my question is, what was right wing politics at the time? Like, how did that factor into 
the organizing that you were doing and how did that organizing counteract those forces from the right? Oof. I mean, another way of phrasing that it, is how is the right then different from the right we're talking about today? Well, one of the ways the, the big difference is we talk about a little while later, some other point, which is the right is much more organized in many ways mm. than they were then. They're really organized. They've been organizing for the last 50 years to get to the place where they are now. We got to remember this was also a time in the 70s with the Boston integration of schools and how that built this right wing racist movement to stop black people from being bust uh, or white kids from being bust. Now, how they whether and 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 the, it's it's a difficult really look it's it's hard to overcome there's there's going to be a body of right wing people in this country that are just not going to change for lots of reasons they're going to be isolated you can't get to them they're not going to be organized with people of color for the most part except for they were from trappings to make themselves feel better it's it's cause it's going to be very it's very difficult however what i've what i can what i see and still see is that you can we can make a dent we can build a huge cross-racial movement in this country. Um, it takes organizing. Look, I, I was thinking about this before we came in here, and this might be a little digression, but as you can stop me, but you were talking, we were talking before we came in, in the conference room just about um, the workers that you're interviewing across the country um, and doing some really incredible work, bringing the voices of working class people that nobody else is really doing Across and you, the, the piece we did here at Real News with the for the, East, the people in East Palestine facing the toxic madness that they're facing in, mm -hmm. in their community, and one of the things that brings people together in this century and an organization like this can play a role in is bringing the voices from across America together to talk, whether they're in East Palestine. Palestine, right? Palestine. Palestine. East Palestine. I call it, we call it Palestine. East Palestine, different place. <laughs> um, Jackson, Mississippi. I mean, before, in, in, which is a majority, majority black city fighting for its rights against these fascists in Mississippi. Um, but having them touch each other and hear each other, and they begin to make alliances. You don't have to make the alliance. The alliances will be made when people get connected. They'll make the alliance. You know, I'm looking at the, I was, before I came in, I was researching, um, cause I had forgotten about them and I remembered them as the, the cowboy Indian alliances that have been formed out West. Like, you know, these cowboys, these are right wing motherfuckers, man. I mean, you know, I mean, they just are. And, and, uh, but I also, I like a lot of them that I knew from my time on the res in Wyoming. But those things, that's how things change. Cause a lot of people's right wing sentiments, yeah, they're bathed deep in racism. And I believe, and I do believe that you can overcome and change that. And they're also bathed in the populist sentiments that are at the root of revolt in America. And there's left-wing populism, there's right-wing populism. But tapping into that populism is what pulls people in. And, and so I really do believe that we can, we can do that. But it, it, it's, it's, and that's, you know, the more I watch the stuff you do and other people are doing here at Real News, the more I see that this is part that, that, you, that this is part of the kernel of making that happen, I think so. I mean, I I, I think I have to think so, right? Because that's that's what binds all of us here: you, me, Stephen Janis, Taya Graham, Mansa Musa, Chris Hedges, all of our incredible co-workers on the editorial side, the studio side, the you know fundraising side. I mean, all of us are committed to that in one way or another, right? And I do, and that's what gets me out of bed in the morning, man, is seeing that in our different areas of work. Because like take Stephen and Taya, like they're focusing on, you know, the abuses of an unchecked, you know, cancerous, constantly growing like police industrial complex. And I rem for most of my life, it was just the goodness of the police was unchallengeable. I remember being on a jury, you know, where the accused was a cop. And during the voir dire process, the lawyer kept asking her the same question, which was, would you be unable to be an impartial juror if the accused was a police officer? 
And I watched person after person say, I can't do it. To me, cops are always right. To me, cops are always telling the truth. And, but I was like, yeah, I got no problem with that. <laughs> right? yeah. So like they let me on the jury, but uh, the, I say all that to say that even just in the matter of from then to now, seeing the change in so many people, even right-wing people, people in rural areas, because we see it happen on our channel when Stephen and Tay are reporting on police violence in Baltimore, you know, against black poor people and police violence against white homeowners in rural America. Like they're all getting treated like shit. And what I'm seeing happening on their channel in the live chats, in the comments is like people doing what you're saying is like they're through that common enemy, through that common struggle to fight this thing. Interesting alliances are forming. I see it on the labor side. You know, people, people will sometimes kind of, uh, send me, you know, emails or, or, you know, DMS saying like, oh, you should interview more right-wing workers. And I was like, I interview right-wing workers all the time. The fact that you can't tell right, right. T- should tell you something about how we don't just fit into these neat we boxes don't. of conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat. Like if you talk about where we come from, how we came to be the people we are, what matters to us, what we fight for, what we live for, um, the times that our bosses give us shit, you know, like, you know, feeling that powerlessness on the job or with when you're talking, trying to struggle to pay rent, right? Or, you know, all these sorts of areas for building those alliances, like you said, for finding that common ground and feeling that human solidarity. Like I see it happen on your show when we're talking about how to address the historical, political, humanitarian monstrosity of Israeli apartheid, right? We see what it's doing to our fellow human beings, our Palestinian brothers, sisters, and siblings, and more and more people are saying this is not right. And you've even brought Zionists on your show to say this is not right. You're doing that work as well. Mansa Musa and Eddie before him are showing and revealing the awfulness, the monstrosity, the moral monstrosity of the prison industrial complex and how it damages not just the human beings who are swallowed into it, but their families, their communities that they're released back into. And so I think that that's, like you said, the best that we can do here on the media side is to try to put more of these disparate pockets of people, put more of the downtrodden in in direct conversation with each other, more people struggling for better workplaces, better communities, better worlds, put them in touch with each other so that they can learn, they can show solidarity, they they can then do that work of building the alliances that need to be built. Yeah. No, and I've, as you were speaking, I was thinking about how, before I came in again, I told you I was talking to Hyatt Thurman, who's now organizing in Northern Alabama, um, and building cross-racial coalitions in Northern Alabama. Um, Hyatt's an amazing guy. He wrote the book, Revolutionary Hillbilly, which is... Yeah, it's a great book. You interviewed him about a year ago yeah, on I did. the show. So if folks right. want to listen to that, yeah. you can go in the catalog and find Mark's conversation with Hyatt Thurman He's a special there. guy. Um, but, so, maybe this is not for this tape, we'll see, but... They're having a conference in September of the new Rainbow Coalition on a res in Wisconsin, an Indian reservation in Wisconsin, and probably one of the Dukes, that's where she lives. I wouldn't be surprised. Anyhow, anyhow I digress. But the, that it would be interesting to, to, to have a conversation with them and connecting all the various people that are interviewed here at Real News and the people you're interviewing at Real News, and it, because it, it fits to have them kind of be part of that conversation, crossing these regional geographic and racial boundaries to come together to say, we can do something different. And I, you know, and, um, you know, there's some of those guys from the old Rainbow Coalition in, in Chicago have never stopped believing that's the way we have to go. I mean, there's a reason why the police broke all that up. You know, you can't have the Brown Berets, the Young Lords, um, uh, the Red Guard, the young patriots, the Black Panthers coming together, 
in that kind of coalition, I mean, that was that was scary stuff for them. They, they want, you know, that they, they, they had to break that, kill that stuff. But that energy is still there, and there's younger people getting into it across the country. I mean, there's the, in in the in white rural neighborhoods in white neighborhoods there are is the you know, the John Brown gun clubs have begun to take on. I mean, um, there's, it's happening in so many different ways because you can lose hope. I went through a period where I just kind of threw up my hands going, we can't beat this. We can't stop them. But then that's ridiculous because that's what we always did. I mean, that's, the, the, those, those are the, when you talk about looking at people back in my generation to, tell, to kind of talk about what went on in the 50s, 60s, 70s, we did the same thing talking to people from the 1930s and the work they were doing, organizing, you know? And as I said, High Thurman said, no, we're not, we're not recreating, it's a continuity. And we have to build that continuity and strengthen it and deepen it because it's there. Yeah. You know? Well, and like you said, it's like at the end of the day, we have no choice but to fight. Um, and this, I think, is, is, has also been the common theme throughout your show and throughout this Rise of the Right series. And yes, we, I, I, just a parenthesis there, we should definitely keep these conversations going because we got to wrap this one up, but there's so much more I want to ask you about. And so I hope that folks listening to this uh, have enjoyed it. Um, as Mark always says, please reach out to him, reach out to us, let us know what you think and what sorts of questions you'd like us to, to ask uh, the great Mark Steiner. Um, and hopefully we can keep these conversations going. Um, but I guess just a sort of closing thought on, you know, the, the, the need to fight, um, because it's like, what else, what's the alternative, right? I mean, fighting does not mean that we're going to win, but not fighting definitely means we're going to lose. Absolutely. And yes. that's kind of where we are. It's like the future is never written in stone. Uh, the arc, the moral arc of the universe bends towards whatever the pressure of the day bends it towards right and so as long as that possibility exists we have no choice but to fight and i think what i've gathered from this conversation especially is that we have a lot of templates we have a lot of examples from the past your past our history right we can look to our history of struggle and see examples of how to get ourselves out of this and i'm really i was really glad to hear you going to say what you did just now which is something that jeff charlotte also said in that great interview that you guys did which is that we're we're not naive here we're not going to reach everybody right right so i want to make that point mainly right. for my fellow millennial leftists and gen z leftists is we're not saying that the people out there saying that like they need to and want to exterminate every trans person that like we're going to go up to them and pat them on the back. Like we have to draw fucking lines in the sand somewhere. But what I'm also saying, what I think you're saying too is it's a big fucking country. There are a lot of people in it, right? You know, and, and, um, you know, not everyone is that far gone. There are people who are maybe susceptible to that poisonous way of thinking who can be brought back from the brick. Yes. The same way that people who were, um, you know, uh, 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 enticed to give in to the seductive allure of white supremacy or the seductive allure of, of seeing their supremacy, male supremacy over women, um, you know, American citizen supremacy over immigrants, right? I mean, all these different ways that, you know, we're taught to sort of feel better than our neighbors and our coworkers because it provides some sort of existential salve when we're still all getting screwed by the same people at the top, right? Um, I think the more that we can work to get people to reject that divide and conquer mentality and come together as a working class as the the great unwashed masses right as the many there because we have that strength in numbers the more that we can build that kind of coalition and do so in a way uh that is lasting um that has real organizational power and and longevity and infrastructure and that is forged together with bonds of real care and commitment 
uh, a lifetime commitment. That way lies the path to our salvation. Always understanding that there are not just kind of ruling class elements that we are fighting against, whether that be Jeff Bezos and Amazon uh, or mm. the bought off political lackeys who are doing Amazon's bidding. Um, you know, they're all kind of connected in this sort of matrix of uh, corruption and class exploitation and they're killing the planet, yada, yada, yada. But we also have to be aware of like, yeah, like where are the other enemies or or agents of our enemies are are in operation whether those be the cops that are beating us and driving scabs through our picket lines or whether those be the you know they could still be working class they could still be poor you know like that doesn't mean that they're always good people they may right. actually be just died in the wool uh, reactionaries who are convinced that the civil war is coming, like Jeff was described, like some of those people that Jeff talked to in his book are fucking scary. Like, and there's no way we're going to reach them. And so what I think back to, this is the last thing I'll say, then I'll toss it to you to sort of close us out. I think back to something that, uh, a great, uh, worker and organizer in New York told me he's, um, uh, when I went up there to do a live show of my podcast, working people, in New York at the People's Forum, I got a bunch of these younger organizers together, incredible folks. Chris Smalls did the opening, right? We had folks from Trader Joe's, Home Depot, uh, Starbucks, and and Labor's Local 79, the construction workers union in New York City. Like their, their union headquarters is right across from Madison Square Garden. And um, Toph, Sarov, uh, a, a full-time organizer with Laborers Local 79, had a really great way of putting this. And I think the way that he's talking about it when you're organizing workers applies very much to like what you're talking about, organizing communities, uh, apartment buildings, so on and so forth. So Toff said, I'm going to, you know, not quoting him verbatim, but he said something to the effect of like when you're trying to unionize or when you're trying to mobilize people in your shop, um, there's usually like a sort of, there's a top layer of people who are really into it. Mm -hmm. Like that's your organizing committee, right? Those are the, those are, those are the people you come back to every single day. Uh, you're strategizing about the next steps. Then there are sort of, there's like this bottom layer of frankly reactionaries, right? The rats, the ones who will snitch on you to the boss, the ones who will try to <laughs> actively undercut the unionizing effort. Um, and then there's this massive amount of people in the middle who can be swung either way. And he said, as an org, as organizers, your job is to, um, collectivize with the people at the top to organize the people in the middle and isolate those people absolutely. at the bottom. Absolutely. So that's ultimately right. what we've got to right. do. Right. I agree. So those agree. are my final thoughts. And I, again, I really hope that we can keep doing these, but I guess I wanted to sort of ask if you had any final thoughts on our first experimental well, Steiner, make quick. All Steiner version of the uh, Rise of the Right. I'm, I'm, I'll make it quick. I think that, that there's a kernel here of the work being done by a number of people at Real News that could coalesce around this idea of bringing disparate voices together to help build something new and get people connected. And that is, that, that is that's the power right there is, is, is in the connectivity and the continuation of the struggle in bringing people together that would not ordinarily come together. And I've seen it happen before this kind of media existed. And I know now that this kind of media can really play a role in, in developing that. I keep thinking back in my head, I said, all those people, you talking about interviewing people we've interviewed, we should get them all to come to this conference in September about building this new cross-racial coalition in America and how that gets done. Hell yeah, baby. <laughs> that would be what I would, that, 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 I, that's, that's the inspiration I'm walking away with today and looking forward to more conversations just about how that happens and bringing people in to talk about that, who we've interviewed, you know, together. And I think that's, that's really important, whether it's the stuff you're doing, the rise of the right, even not in our name, you know, bringing those voices together to say there's a different way. And that's what has to happen because we're facing, we're facing real danger. And we have to stop it, you know? I mean, for our kids, 
for my grandkids, my great grandkids. Yes, I got those two. <laughs> I, was I have to come back saying, to the grave to haunt these motherfuckers. Yeah. <laughs> Well, as I always say, uh, it's an honor to be in the struggle with you. And I feel the same way. I'm glad our paths crossed and put us together here. Me too. Max Alvarez and Mark Steiner. Oh, yeah, brother. And so write to us. Write to me at MSS at TheRealNews.com and write to Max at M-A-X at TheRealNews.com. And we got much more coming. So stay with us. And thank you, David Hepton, for uh, making us sound good. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.